Hey everyone, welcome back. Ever find yourself drowning in notes and flashcards, wondering if there's a better way to, you know, actually learn this stuff? Oh, absolutely. We've all been there. It's so easy to fall into the trap of thinking that just spending hours with the material is enough. Right, like just staring at my textbook for hours on end is going to magically make it stick. Spoiler alert, it doesn't. So how do we break free from that cycle? What's the key to making this information actually stick? Well, it all starts with understanding a bit about how our brains are wired, and specifically this incredible ability called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity. Okay, that sounds a little intimidating. I promise it's not as complicated as it sounds. Basically, it just means that our brains are constantly changing and adapting based on our experiences, like literally rewiring themselves. Wait, so you're telling me every time I try to learn something new, my brain is actually physically changing? Exactly. It's like building a muscle. Yeah. The more you use it, the stronger it gets. And the same goes for those neural pathways in our brains. Okay, that's kind of mind-blowing. So it's not just about the amount of information we're taking in, but how actively we're engaging with it. You got it. Dr. Andrew Huberman, who's a neuroscientist at Stanford, has done some incredible research on this. And he says one of the biggest mistakes people make is assuming that just being exposed to the information is enough. Oh, tell me about it. I'm the queen of highlighting entire chapters of textbooks, but then when it comes to actually recalling that information, total blank. Well, it turns out our brains have this annoying little habit of wanting to forget things. Annoying is an understatement. I feel like I'm fighting a losing battle sometimes. It's not about sabotage, really. It's just that our brains are wired to prioritize information that seems most relevant to our, well, survival. Back in the day, our ancestors didn't need to remember every little detail. They just needed to remember where to find food, how to avoid danger, that kind of thing. Okay, that makes sense. Our brains haven't quite caught up to our modern need to remember, like, historical dates and grammar rules. Exactly. So we have to be a little more strategic about how we approach learning. We need to convince our brains that this information is actually important and worth holding on to. So how do we do that? What's the secret to making our brains sit up and take notice? Well, one of the most effective strategies, and this might surprise you, is actually testing. Testing? Wait, are you serious? As if studying wasn't stressful enough already. Now hold on, I know what you're thinking. But we're not talking about those high-pressure exams that keep you up at night. It's all about the power of self-testing. Okay, self-testing. Like quizzing myself as I go along. Even if it's just me, myself, and I. Precisely. Dr. Huberman's research has shown that even those little mini quizzes can make a huge difference in how much information we retain in the long run. Really? I had no idea something so simple could be so powerful. It's like anything else. The more you practice recalling something, the easier it becomes. You're strengthening those neural pathways every time you make that effort to retrieve the information. So... If we're giving ourselves these pop quizzes as we go along, are there certain types of questions that are better than others? Or is any form of self-testing good self-testing? Yeah, that's a great question. It turns out not all quizzes are created equal. You want to really challenge yourself to recall the information, not just recognize it. Okay, so what does that mean in practice? Like, what's the difference between recognizing and really recalling? Think about it like this. You know how you can sometimes recognize someone's face, but you can't quite place their name or how you know them? Oh, all the time. It's like that awkward moment when you're trying to introduce them to someone else and your brain just draws a blank. Exactly. So recognizing is kind of like that. It's like, oh yeah, that seems familiar. But recalling is when you can pull that information out of your memory banks without any hints or cues. Okay, so how do we apply that to our self-testing? Well, instead of relying on those multiple choice questions where you're just picking from a list of options, try using more open-ended questions that force you to really search for the answer. So ditch the flashcards and try to explain the concepts in my own words. You got it. Or uh, let's say you're trying to memorize a list of vocabulary words. Instead of just looking at the word in definition, cover up the definition and try to write it out from memory. It's like we're training our brains to be less Google, more encyclopedia, right? Sure. Pulling up the information on demand. Exactly. And you know what's even cooler? Dr. Huberman actually used this technique himself when he was in med school. No way! I was just picturing him, like, glued to his textbooks 24-7 back then. He said he aced his notoriously difficult neuroanatomy class by, get this, quizzing himself on brain structures while he was out on walks. See, I love that. Who knew that a little fresh air could be so beneficial for our brains? Right. It's all about making it feel 
less like a chore and more like something you can integrate into your everyday life. So small, consistent efforts over those marathon cramming sessions. Yeah. Got it. Are there other ways we can make our learning more active aside from the self-testing? Because honestly, even the thought of making up quizzes for myself can feel a little overwhelming sometimes. Totally. There are so many ways to mix it up and keep things interesting. Something as simple as summarizing what you've learned in your own words can be really effective. Okay, that feels doable. Sometimes I try to explain things to my dog when I'm learning something new. He's a terrible listener, but it forces me to simplify things and make sure I actually understand it. That's perfect. You're basically teaching the material, even if it's to a furry four-legged friend. And the great thing is, your student doesn't even have to be real. You could talk to an imaginary audience or even just out loud to yourself. So we've got self-testing, we've got summarizing, teaching it to our possibly imaginary friends. Any other brain-boosting strategies up our sleeve? Well, this next one might surprise you because it doesn't involve any studying at all. Okay, now you've really piqued my interest. Tell me more. <laughs> it's all about prioritizing something that uh, a lot of us tend to sacrifice, especially when we're in learning mode, and that's sleep. Sleep. But sleep is for, well, resting dot learning. I know, it seems counterintuitive. <laughs> but trust me on this, sleep is absolutely crucial for consolidating all that hard-earned knowledge. Dr. Huberman refers to it as like, the cleaning crew comes in and tidies everything up. So you mean those late night cramming sessions fueled by caffeine and sheer willpower might actually be doing more harm than good? Think of it this way. Caffeine might help you power through in the moment, but it's like putting a band-aid on sleep deprivation. You really need those deep sleep cycles to move information from your short-term to long-term memory. Okay, that's a game changer. No more glorifying the all-nighter. But what about stress? I feel like stress and studying go hand in hand, but is that actually helping or hindering our ability to learn? It's definitely a balancing act. A little bit of stress, that sense of urgency can actually be beneficial. It kind of kicks our brain into gear and helps us focus. But when stress becomes chronic, it can really interfere with our ability to learn and retain information. So it's about finding that sweet spot of being motivated, but not completely overwhelmed. Easier said than done, am I right? Tell me about it. But the key here is to be aware of your own stress levels and have some healthy coping mechanisms in place, whether it's exercise, meditation, spending time in nature. Find what works for you and make it a priority, especially during those intense learning periods. Stress management. Check. Sleep. Check. This is starting to feel less about cramming information into my brain and more about taking a more holistic approach. Absolutely. It's all connected. Mm -hmm. And speaking of holistic approaches, Dr. Huberman also talks about something called non-sleep deep rest or NSDR. Have you ever heard of this? NSDR. Okay, you're speaking my language now. More acronyms, please. But seriously, what is NSDR? It's actually a pretty simple concept. Don't let the fancy name throw you off. Yeah. Basically, NSDR is all about tapping into that deep relaxation state, similar to what we experience during sleep, but while we're still awake. So kind of like a power nap for the brain without the whole actually falling asleep part. I can get on board with that. Exactly. And the best part is, even just 10 or 20 minutes of NSDR can have some serious benefits. Like Dr. Huberman talks about how it can help offset the negative effects of you know, those times when we don't get enough sleep, which, let's be honest, happens to the best of us. Oh, absolutely. So we can think of it as a secret weapon in our study arsenal. Exactly. And the research suggests it can actually enhance our brain's ability to rewire itself, that whole neuroplasticity thing we were talking about earlier. Okay, I'm sold. Where do I sign up for this NSDR thing? Are we talking meditation apps, calming ocean sounds? What's the secret sauce? You got it. Those are great examples. There are tons of guided NSDR practices out there. You can find them online through meditation apps, all sorts of places. It's really about finding what works best for you and, you know, figuring out how to fit it into your day. Amazing. This is great. So let's recap. We've got self-testing, we're prioritizing sleep, managing that pesky stress, even sneaking in some brain-boosting relaxation. I'm starting to realize that learning effectively isn't just about like brute force memorization. It's mm. about working with our brains, not against them. Right, it's about that big picture. But before we wrap things up, there's one more technique that Dr. Huberman talks about that I think you'll find super interesting. It's called interleaving. Interleaving. Okay, I'll bite. What's interleaving all about? So you know how a lot of us were taught to study by like focusing on one subject at a time. We spend hours on history, then we move on to math and so on. Well, it turns out that might not actually be the most effective way to learn. Wait, really? I'm all ears. Yeah, so there's research that suggests that switching between different subjects, especially subjects that are related in some way during a study session, can actually lead to better learning overall. 
Interesting. So instead of just spending three hours straight on history, maybe I should switch it up, do a little history, then some literature from the same period, then back to history, something like that. Exactly. It might seem a little counterintuitive, but by interleaving, by mixing things up, we're actually forcing our brains to work a little harder. And that extra effort can make a big difference. It's like we're giving our brains a workout by constantly switching gears and making those connections between different concepts. Exactly. And just like with any workout, the more we challenge ourselves, the stronger we become. I love that analogy. So instead of letting our brains settle into a comfortable rhythm with one subject, interleaving keeps things interesting and helps us make those connections across different areas. It's like cross-training for our minds. I like that cross-training for our minds. I'm going to use that. Feel free. It's all yours. But wow, this has been such an eye-opening conversation. Honestly, I'm feeling so much more optimistic about my own learning journey now. That's what we like to hear. And remember, the key is not to put pressure on yourself to be perfect or to try to implement all of these techniques overnight. Start small, experiment, find what works best for you. So true. Learning is definitely a journey, not a destination. And the more we understand about how our amazing brains work, the more effectively we can learn and grow. Mm. Well, on that note, I think it's time for me to put some of these incredible techniques into practice. A little self-testing, a touch of NSDR, maybe even some interleaving while I'm at it. Thanks for joining us on this incredible deep dive into the world of neuroplasticity. My pleasure. And until next time, stay curious and happy learning.